Oh, welcome to one Drupal rule them all. It's a pretty ambitious title. <laughs> um, just a little bit about myself. Um, I'm from Portugal. Um, I've been with Acquia since three years ago. Um, I'm a technical team lead for professional services in Acquia, which means that I, I do several things with Drupal. Um, I mostly work as an architect with, directly with our clients, starting uh, Drupal projects. You can find me in my Twitter or on my personal website. And this presentation is inspired by, by different things. So one of the things that inspired the presentation, or the title of the presentation, it's a blog post by, by Dries in late 2010, where there was this vision of that Drupal starts to replace a lot of other technologies, not only to build websites, or not only to use as a CMS, but start to be used to replace public websites, department websites, um, extranets, internets. So you start having companies that in reality started to really standardize in Drupal. So not only having one site in Drupal, but start having all their online presence or their, all their online strategy um, in Drupal. So when you start having these, and this was back in 2010, so we are in 2014, and it's, this is a reality right now. You have a lot of companies for which Drupal is always the, the first tool that they go to whenever they want to create a website, a platform. They start to have internal teams developing Drupal. So they want to have standards. They want to have just a standard way of creating their Drupal sites, managing their Drupal sites, launching new Drupal sites. And they don't want to rebuild all of their work anytime that they want to launch a new website. So this presentation is mostly about this. It's the challenge to manage a platform of Drupal for sites with common business features. So when you talk about common business features, you also talk about common software, common infrastructure, and how can you manage this this network or this platform of sites um, from a central point of view, launching new sites without introducing more costs um, and just reusing what you have. Most of the times you are also talking about sites that need to communicate with, among each other. So they need to talk, they need to share data, or they need to share user data, they need to share uh, user profiles, they need to share user roles. So it's a, it's a pretty complex uh, problem because in this space, Drupal was made for a single site and not for a network of sites. So let's say that you, you meet a client um, see. and it says that, let's say you are meeting the university and universities are usually um, clients that do have sites in different technologies and they started their online presence probably like 10, 15 years ago. Um, each of the, their departments start building their own online strategy. Um, there was no coordination and therefore right now they do have plenty of websites, plenty of tools, um, and you want to standardize. So the, the experience for managing those sites is not similar, and the experience that you have as a user when you visit their website is not similar. So you don't want to create everything from scratch. Um, they want to create a platform to create sites for their department and their projects, um, and they want to do it in Drupal from a single experience. So they want to have a similar look and feel. Um, you could have a similar backend or a similar backend experience, even if they can go and log in in different places. They need to have the same way of managing those sites. Um, and possibly, if they build something for the Department of Maths, then they enter use it for the Department of Sports, for instance. So they don't want to, anytime that they want to build something new, they don't want to start everything from scratch. So the first question that you do is, so I know that 10 years ago, those were 10 different sites. But in reality, one site is a one Drupal site, or is many sites many Drupal sites? That's, that's a fair question, because Drupal can do it in di two different ways. You can say, I have just a large Drupal site, a single Drupal site, that handles all those mini sites inside it. Or you can create um, several Drupal sites, and each, in reality, they, are, they have its own database, um, and they just support different departments in this case. So two options, right? You have a single Drupal site, which means same code for all the sites. It's the same database for all the sites. Um, and then you use some sort of contrib models that will recognize uh, the context that the user is and would create some sort of sections. So in, the, in this case of the university example that I was giving, um, you'd have a section for the, the math website or the literature website. And all of that is created with a custom contrib model that creates their own user experience. So only people that are editors with the math website can create content there 
or only people that are editors with the sports website can create content there. Still, you could have some headers and footers that are different, some menus that are different, um, but it's the same site. It's just one Drupal site. Other option that you have is that you say, well, I'm going to create many Drupal sites. So anytime that a department wants a site, I launch a new site, a new Drupal site that is based on the same code, but it has its own database, and then it can live in the same infrastructure or it can live somewhere else. Okay? It can live um, in different servers or in the same server. That doesn't matter. Okay? So what's best? It depends on several things. And you have examples in the world of projects of different complexity that are made with one approach or with another approach. It, it, mo it mostly depends on the size difference that you have. How different are, how, how different is the math website with the sports website? Um, what, are, what is shared between those sites? Are you sharing content? Are you sharing users? Um, are you sharing any type of business feature? So yeah, are, is, are the models that are going to be installed in one site similar to the others? Are they different? Do they have a different workflow? Also, sometimes when you start thinking about this problem of creating a platform, usually you are talking about a platform that is going to support your websites for the next years. So it's not only something for next year, it's something for four, five years, three years. When you think about it, you need to think about the evolution of the sites. So right now, you predict that all the sites are going to be similar, but are they going to be similar in two years, in three years? Are those departments working the same way um, or can you put some governance on top of them to make them work the same way? And also it depends on who is responsible to build them or who is responsible to maintain them. Um, if you have different teams with different work methods, then imposing the same method for everyone, it's hard. Also, anytime that one team wants to have a difference or wants to have a change, it's very hard to impose that change to all the others. So let's, anal let's, um, let's analyze the two, the two possibilities. First one, a single Drupal site. So everyone understands what is a single Drupal site. Just one code base, one database, and then sections on the site. So you do have different options to create um, these, um, this approach. Um, things like domain model or, or context or OG, which is my favorite, um, are good solutions to create these sections. Um, it's usually a very good so solution that is used for things like internets with different sections or departments, or webs that are really creating different sections or departments. So it's basically like understanding during the discovery phase of a project, understanding if you are really talking about sites and things that are different, or just sections of the main experience that you are creating. And if you are thinking about, if you are talking about just sections of the main experience that you are creating, then having a single Drupal site, sharing data, sharing users with some sections to divide the, the different feelings of the site and probably some workflow around it, then it's enough. And it works well. And it's easier than just creating different sites that you need to manage separately. So it's usually a better fit for when you need to share data. It's not easy to share data between si Drupal sites, as you know. You need to have, you need to have models that would work in some, some, some way with web services, some, some, some sites publishing data, some others consuming data. And then you need to guarantee that the structures handling those data are similar between the sites. It mostly means that you need to have the same content types. It's hard to define when do you synchronize the content between the sites. Sometimes you need to be able to in real time. Some others you can accept that it's periodically you are importing that, that data. It's also hard to understand what to do when updating data. So if you update a node, what happens with all the others? So if you just have one site and you say, this node is available in mathematical and literature and sports, that's easier than creating different sites. You have a similar user base, so similar user table, same user table, same user profiles, same user roles, and then you can configure it according to the different users that you have. Um, and if you don't have many differences between all those sites, then yeah, it's, it's, it's easier to build it like that. You could have a similar look and feel. You can have different themes as well. You have models that allow you to swap theme if you are in the context of X or Y. You can, you can, if you have, if you build it with organic groups, you can also swap theme if you are in the context of a group or another group as well. Um, so an example of an architecture that supports this model would be using organic groups. And I've seen and I've used this many times. You just define groups to define the sections or the mini sites or the departments if you want. 
organic groups in, in Drupal 7, it's, it's quite powerful. It allows you to define also roles for those groups. So you can associate not only a member with a group, but say this member in this group has the role of editor, and therefore is the only one that can create content there, which is interesting. Um, organic Groups has a very good integration with views, with panels, with rules, so all the Drupal standards are there and it works well. And then there's a couple of uh, complementary models um, that do the nice things that you need to do sometimes when you need to divide a site in sections. Things like OG theme that allows you to swap the theme if you are in the context of a group, um, or OG menu that allows you to add a menu per group, or, or Workbench OG um, which allows you to integrate Workbench with Organic Groups. So it allows you to say, um, I can have editors and publishers in the different groups and then any time that someone creates a content, only the people that are editors in this group can approve it and not the others. Okay? So this was the approach of using just one site. Other option is you create many Drupal sites. So you have one site for the public website, then you have another site for the math website, and then you have another site for the sports website. They usually share the same code base. Okay? So they depend on the same distribution or they depend on the same code base. But they have their own database. So therefore they can have their own configuration. So and if you do this approach, you have usually two options. Either you go with a multi-site installation, um, which is a, a property in Drupal that allows you to run different sites from the same code base, from the same doc root, just defining different folders um, in your Drupal doc root that allows you to define different codes and different settings. Um, for those Drupal sites, or you can say, I'm going to deploy them in different servers. So they depend on the same code base, I synchronize them somehow, but then they are deployed somewhere different. The main difference here is that they have different databases, so therefore they have different configurations. Therefore they don't share anything. They don't share nodes, they don't share users, um, and if you need to synchronize some data between those sites, you need to follow a web service approach. So advantages of using the multi-site approach um, is one code base that you need to maintain. So you, you are just your site; all the sites are served from the same location. So therefore, you just need to whenever you need to push new code, you just push code to a new location. And whenever you need to update code, the same thing. It's easier to reuse your infrastructure. So if we have a smaller infrastructure, if you have a smaller team that maintains those servers, then it's easier to use it because they just need to worry about those servers, those single buckets of servers. Um, there's also some performance implications. So when you run a framework like Drupal, um, you load dozens of PHP files anytime that you do a request. And if you do that, if you don't use something like APC, then it gets, it gets pretty bad. So APC is almost a requirement for, for Drupal sites. Um, if you load all the sites from the same code base, that means that APC can load the same code um, for all your sites which doesn't happen if you are deploying the sites in different servers. So therefore, you have a lower memory utilization. So you are consuming less resources if you want. And it's also simple. The drawbacks there, whatever are, imagine that you are creating um, the, the, the example of the university. And you create, what, there was an event in the mathematical um, website that created a huge peak of traffic. If there is a lot of people coming to the mathematical website and all of them, all the sites are deployed in the same servers, and that means that if, if, if you have a big problem in, in the maths website, you don't affect only the maths website, but you affect all the others because they all live in the same infrastructure. They all run from the same code. Um, it also means that if you need to update code, you're probably affecting all your sites at the same time because you co between, w between the code is updated and you run update PHP and you, you make sure that everything is working and you're affecting all your websites. So you have similar maintenance windows. Um, also, if, um, if you maintain a multi-site, and I, I assume that most people here understand how a multi-site works, but basically it allows you to have different models in different folders and um, each site would use its own folder with the right code. But it's harder to maintain things like um, I want views 7.5 in this model and in this site and I want views blah, 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 in another site. It's harder to, to maintain it. Even if you can do it, it's harder to track all those differences. The other option is you say, well, instead of using multi-site, I can try to deploy sites in different locations. So they can be deployed in different locations, in different servers, 
there's no single point of failure because at that point each of them live in um, different servers basically. Um, it's also easier to support differences, but it's much harder to support things like I want to push a new code update and I want to do it for all these sites. It's harder to do it if you don't have something that controls these updates. Um, and if you are launching the same code to different sites, even if it's nice on the fact that you don't have the same maintenance windows, it gets much harder to test. So you tested the code, it works well in the math department. Okay, you're fine. Now you're going to test it with a sports website. And it fails because there is some difference. So if you allow more differences, that, ca that can be good from a business point of view, but also can be bad because at that point, you are losing the, um, the idea of standardization that you had at the beginning. So assuming you select the multiple site route, so assuming that you forget the organic group approach, you don't want just one site, you realize that I really need a lot of sites to support my business requirements. So if you need that, and if you start going with this route and this strategy, you end up probably in this, in this, in this cross path. So Martin wants to be able to, when Martin understands that they have this tool that they can well, it's very easy to launch new Drupal sites. So why am I spending so much money um, building everything from scratch? I just want to have a way of, in two weeks, in three weeks, prepare my Drupal site and launch it, and just reuse what I have before. At the same time, if you start having a lot of sites and you start launching dozens of websites um, per month, your operations team is going to ask you for a standard process to do it, and you don't want to have to handle a code deployment anytime that um, there is new sites coming and don't want to worry about what's the maintenance that the maintenance procedure that they have to they need to have or the installation procedure that they need to have. So here came um, the idea of factory of sites. So a lot of people start talking about this idea of having a way in Drupal to control the maintenance um, of the different sites that you have in your platform, launching new sites very easily, and still being able to control all of them from the same location, sharing some data between them. So the idea of factory sites is basically um, the ability that you have to run a single code base, a single distribution that you create from the beginning um, with enough models and features that allows you to support your business needs um, and you need to, you, you should be able to launch new sites almost without touching any code. Okay, so basically you prepare your platform, you know, this is my feature, this is what my platform does. And if you just need to create a site exactly with these features, just click, click a button, you launch a new site, you're ready to go. Of course, it doesn't, if it doesn't do what, what you need, if it doesn't fill one of your technical requirements, if you need another model to do it, we don't support it, okay? That's, that's the idea. You create something that allows your business users to edit your site. Um, if it doesn't support what they need to, to build in terms of a feature, then it needs to be included in the platform. Um, but just launching a single site is very easy. So there is limited functionality there. But less is good. The fact that you say, I just support these, that's what you have, you are standardizing. What gives you is the ability that you spin new things very easy. Um, the other thing that a factory of sites should support is the ability to grow. So not only growing in terms of adding new sites, but also growing, adding new servers if there is a problem in the mathematical sites and you realize that you still need to grow your infrastructure, you still want to do it, okay? So it's the ability that you have this platform and you grow it in terms of software and in terms of hardware. So this is not a new problem, okay? There are several um, solutions out there that try to solve this problem in the past and, and today. So there are people trying to do it with custom solutions, and we'll see how, how we can handle it. If you need to think about how to create such a, such a tool or such a platform, how we can create it. Um, there's the Agir project. I don't know if anyone uses Agir in the room. No one? OK. So you? OK. Yeah. So Eager was, a, was a, a Drupal project started in 2007 um, that handles part of this problem. Then Acquia launched Drupal Gardens in 2011. 
Anyone knows Drupal Gardens? Yeah. Okay. And then we, we refactor Drupal Gardens. We make it more enterprise ready. We create a lot of features. Something last year that we called a site factory, which I'm going to, to demo. Um, and Pentium also launched it last year, something called Pentium 1 that uh, follows the same, the same idea. So imagine that you need to do what I've described, the challenge, if you want to do it yourself. Let's say that you have a team in-house and you want to build it. Um, you want to build this, this solution. You want to give your, your bosses this solution. If we think about this, if we start decoupling the problem in smaller parts that you need to solve, this is what you need, basically what you need to, to build such a solution. So you need software, you need infrastructure, and then you need a management server on top of all that. So let's start by probably the easiest one, software, so Drupal. So all of these, if you, if you want to create a base platform that you want to launch new sites based on, there's a very good solution in Drupal to do that. It's called distributions. So it's basically the ability that you have to bundle or package all your models in something that makes sense as uh, something that works out of the box to, to solve a business need. It's called distribution. So you have plenty of distributions in Drupal, things like Drupal Commons or Drupal Commerce um, or Open Atrium, things that are managed. So Drupal out of the box with the right models assembled, it can create the experience that you need. Okay? So if you want to create the same thing for your client to create sites that handle a certain need, then that's what you need, a distribution. You, you, you pick the right model that you want, you make it work all together, um, you provide the documentation that you need all together, and you have a piece of working software. On top of that, apart from packaging all the models and custom models and the patches that you need, you need a way of installing my site. So basically, okay, here is your, your software, how do I install it? So you have something in Drupal called installation profile, all the distributions would have an installation profile. You need to create your own distribution, prof your own installation profile, and it's basically like all the install steps that you need to follow uh, when when provisioning a new site. So things like what's the site name, what's the site email, um, what are the features that you want to enable or disable, because if you create a, a large distribution, let's say that you create a university distribution, um, if you do that, then you could have different features and different sites could enable them. So like the Mathematica website, does it need blogging? Yes or no. Does it need forums? Yes or no. So all of them can, can be features present in the software that can be enabled or disabled at install time or in maintenance time as well. Okay? So this is what you need in terms of software. But it's just one part of the problem. The other problem is you need infrastructure. So you need all servers to manage all those, ser all those sites. And then you can say, well, <coughs> I'm going to put all those sites in the same installation, so on Drupal multi-site, but still you probably need plenty of servers to, to handle them if you are going to support um, an interesting size project or you are going to launch different servers for different sites. So you need, you need a, a configuration management tool to handle the configuration for all those sites. You don't want to have servers running different versions of Apache if you are creating just a platform of, of servers or a platform of sites. The same thing with all the other uh, components of your infrastructure. Also, something that is interesting is if you start creating all these platform of sites, and you, as, as you see, you are providing the ability to create sites for people that are not very tech aware, I would say. So people that are just site builders, they don't know how to code because they don't need to. If they have other right site building skills in Drupal, then they can do a site with the, the platform that you just gave them without going to the nitty pieces of, of code. So they will need to test things. They will need to try things. They will need different environments basically to do that. So they need the development environment, the staging environment, the production environment, where they can just play and see how things are working before doing the change to production. You also probably need to do the same if you start supporting different sites with a very interesting business value, then if you do a change in code, you probably want to test that change in code before applying it to the different sites. And then you need a management server, right? You need something where you log in and you can see all your sites and you can create new sites, delete sites, update sites. You basically need like a console where you manage all your platform. So something like this, right? Admins would go to a management server, they do stuff there they, that creates sites, delete sites, update sites, deploy code to the different servers, and then your users and your editors would just go to the servers and, or to the sites and manage the Drupal sites there. 
Another thing that you need to think about when you create this from scratch is that everything needs to be automatically. You don't want any time that a new site comes to, to live, you don't want the sysadmin to need to log into the server and say, yeah, I need to provision a new virtual host for that, or I need to create a new database for that. Because that's not going to work, that's not going to scale. It's very hard to maintain it if, not, if everything is not automatic. So when you create a new site, everything that's associated with that site needs to be created as well. So what you need to run a Drupal site? You need a database, you need a disk directory where it's going to put all the static files and the, and, um, and the code, and you need virtual host in Apache, right? That needs to be created automatically. What about the server configurations? All the server configurations, things like the PHP configuration, or what are you using in Apache, or what you are using in MySQL, um, how many connections are you allowing them cache, things like that. All of that needs to be also managed from a central location. Okay, so you need things, you need, you need configuration management tools like Puppet or Chef or Ansible um, to manage all this configuration and deploy rapidly any change to all your servers. Then you need something that installs sites, um, which um, Drupal does very well and Drush does very well. Um, you need something to run deployments of code, and you probably don't want to just say, well, I'm copying this via FTP to my server, so you need something much better than that. So you're looking to things like uh, Capistrano or Drush Deploy or custom scripts to deploy code. Is that something that anyone here does? Capistrano, Drush Deploy, anything like that? No. Okay. So it's basically like a way of saying, Okay, I have this code in this repository and I want, I want to launch it to production. I just click a button and it does everything to push the code to the right servers without, being, without the need to just uh, copy code around. And the nice thing about using something like this is that you can say, well, if I try to update the site and the site the update doesn't work, then I don't, I don't swap the site. And therefore you have minimal on time. Yeah. Yeah, that's another, that's another way. I mean, you could... It can, well, you could have something like a git hook and define it in GitHub and there, whenever you push to GitHub, then it copies everything with a custom script to your servers. And yeah, it's, that's very similar to what we do actually in Aquin. We don't, we don't use GitHub, but you have your own Git repository, and whenever you push there, um, it just copies automatically to different servers if you are running from the master a Git branch. And then you need a management server, so something that you log in and you create sites and, and uh, mostly to, to do a management service or a management server this, this one is a custom application that you build. Okay, so if you don't need to create all this from scratch, there's already some things out there that you can use. So Agar, um, it's a community project, so open source project based in Drupal, created in 2007, um, evolved a lot during the last seven years, last the release was last January I believe. So open source, you can just go to Agar, um, download the code, install it in your servers, self-hosted, so you can just use it your own. Um, the idea is that you have, remember the management service that I was talking about? So a service that you can log in and create sites and deploy sites <coughs> and all that. So that's called the host master in Agar. So it's a component that lives in a management service, let's say. And then all your Agar nodes, so all your servers, um, respond to actions that are provided by this host master. Okay, so Agar is by itself is, a is able to do things like um, de deploy controlling code deployment, database creation, BIOS creation. <coughs> so it controls all that. So Agar, it's 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 yeah. It's it's a multi-site configuration. Well, it depends on how you configure it, but the idea is to use it as a multi-site. So in Agar, you define what's called a platform, and that's it's a doc root. And you say, I'm going to deploy this platform in these servers. And then you can create sites on top of these servers. And whenever you do that, you are creating a multi-site. In, in, if you use a multi-site approach, yes. But you can also do something like, I'm creating different platforms in Agar, so different uh, doc routes, and I'm going to deploy them in different uh, servers. And if you do that, you don't have a single point of failure. So it depends on how you use it. But the, the nice features of, of Agar and the nice the ability that you create sites on top of platforms, all of that is based on a multi-site approach. Um, so good things and bad things about Agar. So it's self-hosted, so you can do it yourself. Um, it's, it's good for simple networks or small sites. It works pretty well for what it, it says it does. Um, but it has some drawbacks. So first of all, the first thing is that you are using a Drupal site to manage your infrastructure and your sites. So you're using Drupal to manage 
Apache V hosts and database creation. And it's it's tricky to do it. It's in Drupal. It's, it's not probably the best tool to do it. And and the model that Agar uses to do it, it's, it's also not very uh, straightforward. I would say. Um, installing and configuring Agar is not not very straightforward as well, as well. If you try to to do it by yourself, you probably struggle a bit. Um, and then it has several limitations. I would say that um, for some enterprise clients can be challenging. So deploy code to different servers can be challenging. Um, when you want to update a site in Agar, that means that you are copying everything, creating a, a shadow copy of your server, of, of your site. So it means copy your database, your code, your files. And then you run a bunch of operations there. And when you are happy with it, you swap. If you have a large site, and any time that you want to, update a, you want to run an update of code, you do that, that's very consuming. And probably sometimes you don't need it. Um, and it's also very hard to support the concept of server environments. So it's not really designed for things like I want to have a dev environment, a staging environment, a production environment. So it has a couple of limitations. So <coughs> our first shot as Acre to solve this problem was Drupal Gardens. Um, so Drupal Gardens is it's basically the idea that you have for WordPress.com, right? So I want a WordPress site, and uh, I want a block. And I can just go to this server, go to this service, create my block, and I have my WordPress blog ready to use. Same idea here. I want my Drupal site. Um, I don't want to install it, or I, I don't want to touch code. I just want to have a Drupal site, uh, which is because I just want to have my blog, or my shop website, or something very simple. Or something that even I can demo to clients. So client asks you, so what's Drupal? Can you show me a Drupal site? How, how do I manage a Drupal site? So you can go to Drupal Gardens, register by free, use it by free. It comes with a bunch of models configured um, that are interesting things like rich field types, you have link dates, field collection, what, what you, you have WYSIWYG, you have media, you have a very nice theme editor, you have web forms, you have views. You have a bunch of things that you can show to your clients. Um, and the nice thing is that after you have your site created, you can clone it if you want, or you can create a new site based on the same distribution. Okay, so we use a single distribution, um, called in this case Gardner, um, and based on top of that, we create multi sites. Okay, and anyone can create their own well, its own website, and we also sell it for different clients that would have their own distribution in Gardens, and then you could they, they could launch new sites. It's a multi site installation. It's hosted by, by us. It runs on the same, or it runs on a different uh, stack that we have in Amazon Web Services, but very similar to what we have. So the other nice thing is that as we are in Amazon, and as everything was based in, in Acquit Cloud, similar to Acquit Cloud, then you could just, if you have a peak on one of the, of the sites, you can just grow the infrastructure globally. So you have all these servers powering all those sites, and it would be almost invisible for the users what was happening in the background. So also nice thing about Gardens, um, you have SSO, so single shared or, uh, single sign on, using uh, open IDs. So it means that you could have the same user accounts in all those sites that you have. Um, you couldn't have any code, so basically you would run the code that we provided you. So views, as we provided it, uh, web form, as we provided, but you cannot add things like, for instance, if you want to add panels or something. You cannot do that. <laughs> so you just use what was provided, but was not vendor locking, so you could still export your site. So if you say, I create a bunch of things in Drupal Gardens, but now I want to grow my site outside of Drupal Gardens, you can still do that. You can still export the site from Drupal Gardens and run it now somewhere else. And how we were um, pricing it was basically depending on what you enabled and how many pages you had. So you had a limit of page use, like I don't know what's the limits for for the free ones, but I think like. 50,000 or 100k page views per, per month or something. And then if you pass that, then you start paying. Okay. The other nice thing of Drupal Gardens is that you'd have this idea when you create um, a site. So you'd go to Drupal Gardens, you say, well, and you can still do that. You can go to Drupal Gardens, register your site, and then it's going to ask you, okay, what type of site do you want? And in this case, I say, well, I want a campaign website. So imagine that I am a political party, and I'm going to create one site for each candidate, for each region. Let's say it's a uh, uh, regional elections, for instance. And I want to have different sites for different candidates. All of them, same look and feel, probably like some pictures different, text different, um, composition of the list different, but apart from that, all the same. It's a very good use case for that. So I could say, well, I want comments, I want 
some social sharing with the banner. And then when you finish, you're ready and you have a site to go. And then each candidate will have its own username, its own password, and they can go there and enable what they want and create the content they want on their website. So the limitation is that you couldn't create, you couldn't have code. Okay. Um, so here comes the idea of site factories. So basically the idea of um, having the same features that you have in gardens but better supported and you could have code running. So you could create your own distribution uh, and you could um, launch new sites based on that distribution. You have a control panel, as I was saying since the beginning, so you have a location where you can go and you can create new sites, delete sites, um, update the sites and still manage things that are uh, similar to all of them. So all the code is controlled from a Git repository. That's where you are putting your code. That's where you are putting your distribution. So anytime that you need to do a change, that goes to Git repository. And you have two environments for each site that you created. You have staging and you have production. So anytime that you want to do a change, you can just go to staging, do the change, see if you're happy, or apply, apply a code update on stage and see <coughs> if you're happy. And if you are, do it again in, in production. So, and you can clone all these sites for sandbox or to staging anytime that you want. So let's say that you have 250 candidates in your, in, our, in your party and you want to have a test in only five or 10 of them, see if your code update breaks anything. You don't need to test it in all of them probably because if the code is all the same, if the configuration is pretty similar, then it's not going to break all of them. You set, we saw it in, in three different models. Um, either with SAS, which means that you cannot add code. SAS plus, you can add code, but we need to verify it. Or PASS, which means that we support the platform, you support the code, and you can add whatever code that you want. Um, the nice thing about it is that you have the freedom to customize what you need in terms of code, and you have all the features that you have with Aqua Cloud before, um, so you have all the scalability associated and also support included. Um, and the nice thing about it is that you are not running in a custom solution, so this is based the largest networks of Drupal websites in the world are based in, in, in our platform, and therefore you know that uh, you are based on the same thing that is already tested and um, in use for big people. So let's see if I can just give you a quick demo of two minutes. So here you have your panel. So you have your panel with all your sites that you have. You can create new sites if you want. You have an illustration where you can see whenever you are updating code or creating new sites or creating a sandboxes to your sites. All of that is managed through tasks, so you can see um, what's the task status that you are creating. Creating a new site based on your distribution is just selecting the site name. So in this case, I have two sites. You can, uh, you can group them by groups, so you could have like different people managing different groups of sites as well. So imagine that you want to have um, a site for, for Cáceres or for, for Badajoz. You just want to have click continue and that's going to create everything after you enable what you want. So you say, well, I want to create a site, then I can enable comments, enable the mailing lists, enabling forums. When I have it, it, just click create site. And there you go. It's going to create a site in the next five or ten minutes. And then it's going to have its own domain. This is the way that you manage the code. So you have two different environments staging and production, and you could update the code in staging and production. As I said, the code is based in the Git repository, so whenever you say, okay, all my sites are running in production, let me see what's the Git repository that I want to select to, and I can select, I want to run certain tag or certain release or a certain branch that I have in my Git repository, and then I run the update and that deploys to all sites. And you can see the status of the update that you are doing. And that's it. So just before questions, 
we are hiring still <laughs> and always. <laughs> so consultants support sales, engineering, um, based in the UK, but not only. Um, so if you feel that you you'd like to work in some of the things that we are working on, just feel free to reach to, uh, to me or someone at the booth. And end of the demo. So time for questions. Anything? Anyone doing something similar on a custom base? Um, we probably should have around 40, 50 people here. Um, between sales, marketing, and my team, professional services, support, and uh, we don't have a, we don't have we don't we have a couple of engineers here as well, but they report directly to the US. Yeah. Yep. Does the um, the site Um, so it integrates with AquiCloud, and the nice thing with AquiCloud is that it ex exposes a lot of um, our uh, endpoints or our actions. They are uh, they, they are triggered. You can trigger them uh, with the REST API. So you can say, if you if you eat this web service, this REST endpoint, then you can say deploy this code to here or copy this database from staging to production. So you could define your Jenkins jobs that in reality just call the REST API to do all that. If your build is failing in terms of your code is assembled incorrectly or yeah, just assume that I press update and the hot fix update and the buttons mm -hmm. and it breaks the you know, breaks my tests. So if it, yeah, it wouldn't run tests, that that's the thing. So if you want to do something like that, you'll need to do it well, I would say before doing the deployment. So you could have something that would run a Jenkins jobs that would do the deployment. And then you can run from the Jenkins job, you can run test your tests. And then when you are happy with it, you probably can apply the same update that you just did it in production as well. So something like that. And then you need to run your test, either our unit or functional or whatever. You need to run them in your server, in your site. What tests do you use um, We do a lot of things. Depends on what you, what you are doing. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of BHAD being used. Um, things like functional testing, things like selling B hats, stuff like that, um, and I, I'm not sure what's what's the unit test that they use in um, in Site Factory, but I'm pretty sure they would use something like a PHP unit to test a lot of their actions, like simple things. But we would use it for internally, so our our internal reviews would have some some tests associated with it, so not something visible to to the client. And the client would need to run their own tests because it's their domain, their their domain of knowledge, so they will know it. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 You would have, yeah, you would have a limit, so you probably wouldn't be able to kill the Amazon instance. But yeah, your your application would be very slow. So if you have a case like that, yes. Um, and well, it really depends on how much content you'd have in Drupal Gardens. But in Drupal Gardens, you'd have some some notification saying you can create a view. Yeah. No. Some. <laughs> Some imagination. <laughs> you can do a lot of things with views. <laughs> More questions? Yep. Yes. Yeah. I'll put the slides there. Yeah. Okay. Well, you can finish then. Thank you very much for your time.